Happy Mother's Day. Uh, if you, um, we won't take the time right now, but we've got some flowers over there for the mothers. She's already got one. Uh, Brother Stevie, make sure you take one home to your wife. And, and uh, so we are glad that you're here on this Mother's Day. And he read, he read that chapter and you begin looking at that like, really? That's a Mother's Day text? <laughs> Mothers are supposed to be honored on Mother's Day, and I agree with that. They're supposed to be uh, recognized, and we certainly try to do that. And then I get up here and, and uh, read a chapter that says women are supposed to have modest apparel. Like, why are you picking on the women? Shamefacedness. <clears throat> so this passage actually came up, has come up a few times in the last, I don't know, maybe month or two. And uh, there's a few things that I kind of skipped as we went through this, I kind of just briefly mentioned the chapter and skipped those. And uh, let's take a minute, first of all, to look at what shamefacedness is. So this is just pretty much uh, uh, just kind of way, just kind of instruction here. 1 Peter 3, 4 is a cross-reference. 1 Peter 3, 4. This is something I think I have uh, skipped a few times. And you say, what is shamefacedness? What does that actually mean? Is she supposed to walk around like she's ashamed? Well, not necessarily, but maybe another word that we might use would be bashful. That, isn't being bashful kind of a feminine thing? You know what I mean? When men are bashful, it doesn't seem very manly, right? But when a woman is bashful, that just tends to be, you know, a little bit more of, a, uh, uh, of an attribute that they might have. So 1 Peter... 3 verse 4 says, but let it be. This is very similar. If you look at verse 3, it's saying the same things. Whose dorning let it not be of outward adorning of the plating of hair, the wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be of the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, a great price. So you see the idea is talking about a woman who is just meek, and uh, she's humble, she's of a quiet spirit. That's kind of what shamefacedness is talking about, okay? And so, you know, in a lot of women, that would be a natural uh, sort of attribute of a woman who's feminine and all that. But then you got a lot of women today who are like trying to be the opposite of everything that First Timothy says, everything that Peter says, and, uh, and that is a problem. So, yeah, so it's talking about shamefacedness, modest, modest apparel, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. And in verse 12, it says to be in silence. You know, that's not a very happy Mother's Day type thing. Well, uh, I, I was, wasn't sure what I was going to preach. I have two Mother's Day, well, three Mother's Day messages today. Okay, I already preached one. And two, I wasn't, I wasn't sure if I was going to preach this one. Uh, or another one. I wish you could hear the other one too. Maybe you could uh, see the live stream or something like that. The other message I'm going to preach tonight in Iola, uh, because it actually fits into the Bible reading schedule for the for last week, and uh, that's what I try to do every Sunday night. And it's talking about the looking to women, looking to women. And the funny thing is, uh, my wife has has, has we, we were talking about this on the way home, and oftentimes. There, is, uh, there are a couple particular ladies I look to whenever I'm preaching. I don't know why. It's like for affirmation, there's certain ladies that I look at because they, they, there's a certain smile on their face or, or you know, they seem like they're with it or something, and I look for them. The other one is my wife, no doubt. You guys have all noticed that. Like I'm just like, oh, what? <laughs> what day is it? That wasn't the right verse? What? <laughs> I really rely on her, and I lean on her. And that's natural. You know, she's my, she, my help meet for me, right? I started to say help me, but see, again, my wife would have got on to me for that. <laughs> my wife, I mean, my help that is meat for me, right? And so I look at that. And so I got to, we got to talking about that. And I realized other guys have picked up on that. I don't know if it's because they watch me or if it's just my wife's personality or whatever, but they'll start saying something and then they'll just look to her like, was that right? Or, or something like that. And so I began to think, was that wrong? Is that a wrong thing to do? Like, should we never, should we just kind of ignore the ladies, you know, like, hey, is it your place or whatever? And when you start going through the Bible, you see that's just not the case. There are a lot of women that were looked up to in the, the Bible. And so I'm preaching that in Iola tonight. However, do you know it is a punishment of God when a nation is run by a lady or children are oppressors, you know, to the nation? 
and uh, and I want to bring some of that up uh, too. So so sometimes when the woman is looked up to to the point where they overlook the man and who cares about the man, that's actually a shame and that could actually be a punishment of God. But there are good godly women in the Bible, you know that that the men seem to look up to and went to and one of the you know prophetesses that they went to to go seek for counsel, you know. And then you think of, of, of Deborah, you know, uh, he, but everybody turned to her, you know, are we going to win this battle? What's going to, yeah, I'll go into the battle, but you got to go with me. And she said, all right, but it's going to be a shame unto you and a woman's going to bring, bring you down. So anyway, there's a, there's a mixture there. Ideally, uh, if I keep this up, you won't have to listen to the message tonight. I'm going to preach it. But <laughs> ideally... When a husband and a wife work together in the right relationship, especially in the ministry, a pastor and a pastor's wife, it's a team effort. And uh, you can see that with Aquila and Priscilla, uh, a great example of that. They work together and it seems like, man, she was just a joint worker with him. And so there's nothing wrong with that. God made that to be the case. And there's a definite, definite uh, need and a place for good godly women, and even the counsel that they can provide. But the Bible obviously makes the man, uh, puts the, the responsibility on the man to be the leader and to be the head of the household and all that kind of stuff. And so when you're reading in this chapter in 1 Timothy 2, you say, man, I mean, the, the, the world would say this is just terrible. Like this is toxic masculinity right here. You know, how could you talk about these kinds of things? And then it goes down and Paul provides this little bit of a nugget of hope for the women. Verse 15 says, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. And so this is one of those things that I've skipped over a few times. I mean, I, I think I've preached a message somewhere where I kind of explain, explain this, but I don't remember it. But I know here, last few times we've read this, I've just kind of thought, you know, I'll leave that alone for now. And so today I actually want to bring that up because uh, motherhood, obvious childbearing, right? That's, that's a, a big deal. So the question is, what does it mean? Saved in childbearing. She shall be saved in childbearing. And it's interesting some of the views that are out there as to what that might mean. So I'm going to mention a few views uh, that, you know, if you look at 10 commentaries, you'll probably get five different answers. I mean, some of them might agree on some, but uh, you're just going to have to, uh, you know, search the scripture and try to figure that out what that means. I'm going to try to help you. I'm going to tell you what I think it means at the end. But here's a little tip. You maybe have heard me say this before, but when you're preaching and you come across a passage and you're like, I'm not 100% sure that that's what this means, okay? What I like to do is go ahead and present that there are other arguments out there. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to like know all the answers and be right all the time. Go ahead and present that there are other arguments out there and explain why you fall on the one that you fall, right? And explain what that means. But here's a little tip that I've learned. I just always want to make sure that whatever conclusion I come to on a text, it lines up with all the scripture. It's not like some obscure like... How do you get that definition where there's nowhere else in the Bible that fits that? Does that make sense? That's what a lot of people would do. They'll say, no, nope, that's what it means. And they'll take some super, you know, literal approach to it, which I believe in the, in the Bible being literal. But sometimes when you line it up with the rest of Scripture, it doesn't make sense. So an example of that was the first time I ever taught on the uh, uh, sons of God and the daughters uh, of men. Sons of God and the daughters of men. And I taught, uh, I was teaching the young people, the, the youth group. And I taught, uh, you know, that there are three different views out there because I, I, at that point I wasn't 100% sure. I said there's three different views out here, but there's only one view that I think is t in total alignment with all of Scripture, and that is this. Godly folk should stick with godly folk, and they have no business intermingling with the ungodly, right? And so I stuck with that line of Seth view. That means that that is talking about the godly, those who called upon the Lord and began to follow him. It fits the narrative of, of all that scripture. So even if I'm wrong, it's a view that I can teach that lines up with all the scripture. Does that make sense? And so that's your safe, your safe bet. Not just picking some kind of weird, you know, well, if you, if you hold your Bible just at the right angle and you <laughs> do some kind of mental gymnastics, you can make it say that. That's not what we're trying to do, okay? 
All right, so what does this mean? Number one, some people say they actually put a, a reliance on the word saved as spiritually saved, your salvation. So saved in childbearing. Saved in childbearing. What does that mean? If you bear a child, then you're just automatically saved? <laughs> is, that, is that what that means? There's, so there's no doubt, I will say this, uh, some, some would say that they're saved by the child that the woman produced, which would be Jesus. All right. And so, you know, I'm going to save my, my view for the last view, but I'm going to say this is one of the views out there. And it makes sense. Surely, all throughout history, when a woman was conceiving, she probably thought this could be the Savior of the world. <laughs> you know, this could be, you know, the one that God has promised. Who knows? But the fact is, whoever it was going to be, some woman was going to have the seed right, that would save the world. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is promised since the very first birth. Genesis 3, verse 15. The punishment on uh, the serpent after the fall of man. He says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. All right, and so obviously this is talking about a spiritual seed, not uh, the literal, you know, uh, uh, line of Eve necessarily, but from a spiritual standpoint, okay? So you have the devil and what he produces, right? Which, by the way, if you're not, if, you're, if, if, if the Father isn't your God, Right? If, he's not, if you haven't accepted Jesus and have God as your father, then the Bible says you're of your father the devil. Right? Particularly somebody who is just like a reprobate. You know, you call them sons of Belial. Those are, those are sons of the devil doing what the devil you know, would bid, bid them to do. <clears throat> and then you have those who have received Christ. Those are the children of God. All right? So you have one seed, uh, which is a godly seed, and you have one seed, which is a, a wicked seed. At the end, the Bible says that I will, short, uh, uh, I will shortly bruise Satan's, Satan under your heels, okay? And he's talking to the church, all right? So Jesus is the one who conquers the, the devil, right? But he does it through the church. We continue to preach the word of God. We continue to hold fast unto that, and he accomplishes that. But, but, but he is saying here that there's going to be this seed. First time I read that as a little kid, I thought, that's why women hate snakes. He says they're going to be at enmity with us. <laughs> so every offspring of the woman is going to hate all the all snakes. And then I started finding some women that actually like snakes. And I was like, well, this isn't right. <laughs> he says you're going to be at enmity, but he's talking about a spiritual seed. OK, but still think about people that name their kid Joshua. You know what Joshua means? That's basically the Hebrew word for Jesus and Savior. Right. And so all these people were were. Uh, uh, having children, maybe it's Jehovah saves or something like that. And, and all these, uh, you know, they were, they were no doubt trying to just hope that one day, that's why if a woman was barren, it was such a, it was such a bad thing back then, because man, it was like their mission in life, their goal to have a child, you know, into, uh, uh, hopefully it would even be the Messiah. I mean, I, I don't know to what extent a woman would think that, but that was the case. Okay. So by this interpretation, if you go back to our text there in 1 Timothy, they rely on verse 13 and 14. Because if it's talking about the women and all of a sudden it says saved and child bearing, obviously Jesus already came. He's preaching to Timothy, right? He's preaching at a time. Christ has already came. He has already risen now. He died, buried, rose again. But if in this context, they're looking at verse 13 and 14, and it says, uh, For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So I look at that and say, I, I can see what they're saying. Like all of a sudden he breaks away and he talks about Eve. And then it says, notwithstanding, you know, she shall be saved 
in childbearing. And then it really throws me off because then it says, and if they continue, and then it says, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety, well, what, is, what does that have to do with whether or not Jesus will save anybody? You know what I mean? If, if he's going to be born and save anybody. So anyway, I find, I find a little bit of lacking there. Surely you could say, uh, you know, there was some kind of reference being made maybe to this seed, this godly seed, and to Eve and all that. I don't think what, this is what that chapter is talking about. Because if you read verse 1 all the way down, and it's, and it's telling you uh, all these different things that we're supposed to do in the church, and then it talks about the men, and then it says, in like manner, the women, and then it begins to explain what the women's role is and what they're supposed to do. Yeah, it sticks in there a, a, a little bit about Eve, but then it says, notwithstanding... She shall be saved in childbearing. And I wrestled with this. Who is the they? Is the they the children that she bears? Or is the they talking about women in general? And I'm falling on the conclusion that it's women because in the, in the context of the whole chapter, it goes back and forth between the singular and the plural on women. So I don't think that's a big issue, but I'll show you here in a minute where I don't even think that really matters. Okay, but number two, here's another view somebody might say. Save through childbearing, okay? She shall be saved through childbearing. They'll say, well, here's what it's saying. She shall be saved through childbearing. In other words, when she has a child, right, she'll be spared from through. She'll be taken through that childbearing. She'll be saved. She won't die or whatever. You know, she'll she'll make it through the childbearing. That's one of the things uh, that they say. Now, look, the pain of childbearing is a part of the curse, right? In fact, if you read that next verse, hold your place, we'll come back, but go back to Genesis again. Genesis 3, we read uh, Satan's curse. But if you read before that, you see Eve's curse. Genesis 3, verse 15. I mean, verse, now we're in verse 16. It says, Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Okay, so now everything we just read in 1 Timothy 2, it's, on, it's like we're reading that as saying, like, well, that's part of the curse of mankind. The curse is the men are supposed to work by the sweat of their brow. It's supposed to be difficult on them. You know, they're supposed to be uh, uh, doing all these things, handling all these things, the responsibilities on them, now, whether it's easier or not easier, that's what, that's what it's supposed to be. And the woman is going to have pain when she delivers and conceives and has children. And, uh, and so there's going to be uh, suffering involved on her end. And so this context is you're saying that the woman is supposed to be, you know, silent and not teach, not usurp authority over the men and the Men, the husbands are supposed to uh, uh, lead, lead them and rule over them and all this. Sounds like a harsh thing, but it's not like it's a punishment in the sense of, you know, I'm going to punish you. Here's the punishment. You're going to have men rule over you and make your heart, your life hard. No, I think the punishment is like the same way God cursed all of creation. It's just a natural punishment. It's just a natural thing that is woven into the fabric of nature, all right? Therefore, God, by design, made it to where all women, don't tell the feminists this, are going to need a man <laughs> to help them. All women are going to need a, I don't need no man, right? A couple minutes later, hey, can you help me pick this up? <laughs> can you reach that for me, right? They need a man. But it's not like it's just like, oh, I'm going to make it to where you need a man. Necessarily, it's just the curse of this fallen world, right? One of the things is a woman, when she bears children, is going to be, it's going to be painful. But another thing is, right, the man is going to have to rule over her. She's going to be subject to men. Look, I don't care how much they try to fight, how much they try to get, you know, equal uh, wages and stuff like that. Men will always rule over women. Now, women ought to be thankful that in a Christian worldview, according to the Bible, women are supposed to be cherished and loved and taken care of and protected, right? In some cultures where the men rule over the women just because they're stronger and meaner and tougher, right? The women don't get that kind of treatment, right? But Jesus said, hey, honor them. They're the weaker vessel. They're fragile. Take care of them. Protect them. All this kind of stuff. 
All right, so that was a part of just the curse of this fallen world. All right, that's just the way it works. That's how nature is now. So in this perspective, uh, a man, a man who's, right, let's, let's turn it on the men for a second, okay? Now, we live in a culture where it's unbelievable. You've probably seen it. There are a lot of cases where a woman is working two jobs, comes home, she cooks, raising the children, and the deadbeat dad is just sitting down playing video games. Well, <laughs> have you seen that? I see it all the time. And it's almost like some of these women are looking for that kind of man. I have no idea why. They just want another child or what. But it's like, you know, oh, isn't that so sweet? No, it's disgusting. Right. <laughs> right? She's out there working two jobs. I just can't do this all. I need some help, you know. And, 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 and she just comes home. She has to do the cooking. She has to do the laundry, all this. The man's out playing with his friends, partying, playing video games, doing all this stuff. That's not, <laughs> that's not the way God designed it, right? So here, so let's turn it on the men for a second. If the woman has certain limitations, if she's the weaker vessel, if she has to endure a hard time during pregnancy, and it's tough, right? It's tough on the women. And they have to do that. They have to endure all that. Look, they're going to be home. If, you're, if we're going by 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, they're going to be home. They're going to be in subjection. They're going to be raising these kids. They're going to be all these things that sound really negative, right? Don't you think the man then should say, well, I'm at least going to go out there and suffer a little bit myself. <laughs> if she's got to suffer, I'm going to suffer. But my suffering is, wow, she's home. I'm out there working double job if I have to, you know, work, pick up another job, work hard, you know, make sure the bills are paid and all that kind of stuff. It's the way God designed us. I preached this morning in Iola about the, uh, I, I said, the, um, a mother's wings, all right? And I talked a little bit about wings. And I use the analogy, in the, which the Bible gives. Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered your children under my arms like a hen, right? One version says, and her broods, right? Or her brood. And another one says, her chickens under her wings, all right, sounds like an interesting passage. Why did he use that analogy? Until I started studying out what a chicken does. How many of you guys have ever been around chickens and watched them a little bit? And how a chicken, actually a hen, takes care of her chicks like you wouldn't believe. If any kind of predator comes around, I mean, she'll go peck them, right? And then she'll run back and protect her little ones. And the little ones just follow her everywhere she goes, right? And, and I saw one uh, video where it's storming outside. It's like a third world country and it's storming out. And, uh, and right in the street, somebody started filming this, uh, this chicken because, you know, third world countries and in some places in the United States, chickens walk up and down the streets. <laughs> and so they're filming this chicken in the middle of the streets, this hen, and she's got probably six or seven little chicks under her. And she's holding us up. She's getting drenched, you know, poured on. But those chicks are just dry as can be, and they're cuddled up under their, their mother's warmth and all that stuff. And so that's the way God designed it. And so I was explaining to them this morning that here's what happens. What about that rooster? What's he doing? Right? He's not protecting those kids. I mean, he might be doing something, but, you know, them roosters, they just walk around all, all proud and all that. And sometimes men can be kind of like that. But look, here's how God put it. In. Here's what God put in our nature. All right. Uh, and I use this illustration. If, if we're just at home and, you know, now my kids are getting older, but I'm, I'm thinking back a little ways. We're at home and we hear it sounds like somebody's getting ready to break into the house. Do you think they're going to come run into my arms? Right. Dad will protect me. No, they're going to go run to mommy's arms and they're going to say, Dad, go protect us. <laughs> I'll get my comfort from my mom, right, and my love and my affection and all that from my mom, and the protection and the provision and all that from dad. He needs to go out there and do that. That's the way God designed it. That's the way it's supposed to be. All right, that's part of the nature that God put here. We can like it or not like it. It doesn't really matter. And, and when you read that in the Bible, you say, it's so true. It's so true, and it's natural. It's not like, you know, there's some, this is some weird book that's forcing some weird rules on us. It's natural. We're the weird ones when we try to fight against it, all right, because right. it goes against nature, all right? And so it's really interesting. Childbearing is just part of that, that whole experience, that whole part of curse of fallen man. 
And obviously, you know, childbearing is also a beautiful thing, as we'll get to here in a second. <clears throat> but the man ought to work hard as well. It's not like, yeah, we're just going to sit down and play video games while our wife does all the work. Okay, that would be crazy. 1 Timothy 5, 8, But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Like even an infidel naturally knows, hey, i got to take care of my family. <laughs> right? But we don't want to be like that. Okay, so, but here's the thing. As a whole... It is true. Women survive, mostly, mostly, women survive childbearing. And uh, so this idea of them being saved through childbearing, okay, you could say that, but what about this? What about the examples in the Bible of ladies that didn't make it through childbearing? Let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 35. Genesis 35. Look at verse 17. This is talking about Rachel. All right. She travailed and she had hard labor. Verse 17. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. Okay. And of course, in the next verse, her soul was in departing and she passes away. But the midwife is like, you're going to have this child. Right. Even though you're going to, you know, even though she ends up passing away, she has this child. She didn't make it through. She wasn't saved through childbearing, was she? How about uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4? 1 Samuel chapter 4. Now look at verse 19. <clears throat> this is... Uh, you know, Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they, Eli and his sons die. And his daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, uh, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son." But she answered not, neither did she regard it. I just, just popped in my mind just now, but isn't that so opposite of what we see so often in our world today? It's like, well, me first. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. You can let the baby die, but I, you better save me. right? Yeah. And here you see these people, they're on their deathbed. They're fixing to die, and they're saying, hey, don't worry. This baby's going to be born. <laughs> isn't that something? <clears throat> They weren't saved, though, through childbearing. So, so what, is, what does that mean? Well, here's a, third, here's a third view. This is a very rare view, but there are some people that look at this view. Some people say this, a woman goes to heaven if they die in labor. <laughs> here's what's funny. This is a Muslim belief. I mean, there are some Christian interpretations of that, verse. very few, but there are some that believe that. But here's a, a Muslim. Here's a little writing from Muslim. I don't think this is out of the Quran, but it's some kind of writings of theirs. I'm not well-versed in, in uh, Muslim, in, in Islam. <laughs> Here's what it says. Who is counted as a shahid, or which means martyr, among you? And then the person answered, the one who fights and is killed for the sake of Allah. You understand that. They think if they, are, if they die as a martyr for Allah, then they'll go to heaven. Okay, you, you understand that. And then, I think this is the prophet. I think this is supposed to be Muhammad talking. He says, then the Sahids among my, my Ummah would be few. So he's saying, like, if it's just the ones, you know, that die, you know, they, they, they die for me, you know, as a martyr, it'll be very few. And he says this, the one who is killed for the sake of Allah is a Shahid or a martyr. The one who dies of plague is a Shahid. The one who dies of a stomach disease is a Shahid. The woman who dies with a child in her womb is a shahid. You know what I've noticed about all false religions is like they want to say there's only one way to get to heaven. you got to please God. And then it's like they realize nobody can please God, so they start saying, okay, we'll make this exception and this exception. <laughs> we'll get purgatory, you know, maybe you can get out. And it's just like let's make it as easy as we can because we know like this is, this is a tall, tall order, you know, to, to fit. And, and so, look, we know that's not true. You know, we know 
Nobody is going to get into heaven based on their works. Nobody is getting to heaven because their death was more honorable than somebody else's death. Uh, we understand that is not uh, uh, salvation at all. And in fact, if that's the case in, that, in our text, then why does it go on to say, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety, unless they're saying they have to continue on their deathbed? <laughs> that's, but no, no, no. We know that view is false. Okay? So here is the view that I think we can get. Let's go back there, 1 Timothy. Here is the view I think that makes the most sense and lines up with Scripture. I think that through childbearing, the whole family really, but the woman is what, who he's, who's being addressed here. The woman is saved, not meaning that she goes to heaven, right? But she's saved from various troubles and hardships in this life through the child that she bears, through the offspring. She could be relieved from some of this. So the hope is that if a woman does right in raising her children and setting a good example, then her children will be a blessing and a help to the family, okay? So, so now you see where it doesn't matter. Let's go back to that verse there, 15 notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. To an, to an extent, it doesn't matter if this is talking about the children or it's talking about the mother, because here's the idea. If the mother sets a godly example to these children after they're born and she lives in faith and godliness, she raises those kids the way that they're supposed to, and then if they go on and they carry out what their mother taught them, and they live godly and holy, doing what their parents taught them to do, well, guess what? That child is going to end up saving, not spiritually saving, but saving them, you know, because they're doing what they're supposed to do. And uh, they're con contributing to several things. So here's some things that they might be saved from, okay? They might be saved through the hard labor that they're doing, you know, that... We have it pretty easy now in our society, in the United States, in 2020, even with the coronavirus, we have things pretty easy, <laughs> right? Some parts of the world, not so easy. I was just hearing a testimony from somebody in India, right? And they said they're also doing lockdown. The thing is, when we get locked down, there's a lot of help. There's a lot of uh, assistance from the government. There's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, loopholes, and we still maybe savings you had enough savings don't you love all those movie stars that are living in their mansions and they're making this video now do the right thing and stay home as they're in their jacuzzi and <laughs> you know in their mansion you guys do the right thing and stay home now uh, during this time and save lives right and so they're doing that but in india you have to understand in india certain parts of india another a lot of other places in the world they will work an entire day right maybe 12 hours in order to bring home some food so that their family can eat, right? You talk about living paycheck to paycheck. These guys are like literally working for their meal so that their family can eat, right? And so when you say, nope, you have to lock down, you can't go anywhere, these people are literally starving, right? Because they don't have a, a, a way to do that. And so in a culture like that where every day you're relying on, hey, we need to go out and we need to work the garden. You know, we need to go out and we need to, uh, you know, butcher a cow or something. I don't know. We need to do all these things. You need help, right? This is why farmers loved having lots of sons. <laughs> they could go out and they could plow. They could do all this work, right, to uh, make, the, uh, make the labor a little lighter. Look at Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, <clears throat> in verse 29, Genesis 5, 29. <clears throat> Lamech has a son, and he calls his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. All right, here's what they're saying. I realize that this is, no, this is a male talking, but here's the idea. Through childbearing, through bearing Noah, we're going to be saved from the hard work and the labor that we, have to, that we have to do. In fact, the very first child that's born, 
I kind of get that, uh, impl- that, that uh, same kind of an idea from uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. The first child was born. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. It was like, wow, good, I have some help. You know, I have somebody that can till. I got somebody that can, you know, um, uh, work the ground. Another guy that can raise the sheep and all this stuff. You know, many hands make light work. And so uh, I think that's the, that's the idea here. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. So a person can be through childbearing... They can be saved through the labor, you know, that it takes to, uh, uh, to operate the household. They have some helpers with them. They could also be saved spiritually by the next generation. You've got a wicked generation, you know, and this woman says, what can I do? I can't get up and, and just preach and just rip face and all this. The Bible says I'm not supposed to be a pastor. I'm not supposed to teach the men, all this kind of. What can I do? Well, here's what you can do. You can raise a son. Teach him to be a godly man, point him in the right direction, teach him the Bible, and guess what? He could turn this nation around through the preaching of the gospel. And uh, I mean, obviously, women can preach the gospel, but you know what I'm saying? She could, by the work that she invests in a son, by her godly example, by what she shows him and teaches him, and then him going on and taking that and saying, I want to be a godly, uh, follow, you know, what's been passed down to me, they can save that family. Or even a generation, spiritually speaking. 2 Timothy 1, uh, uh, verses 3 through 6. Paul says about Timothy, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. Now look at this. Which dwell first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and a love and a sound mind. So you see here this picture that's being painted of a godly grandmother, right, who, who had a daughter and passed on some godly wisdom to her and showed her the scriptures and taught her how to be a good woman. And then that woman has a son named Timothy, and she teaches him the scripture. He gets saved, praise the Lord, right? The scriptures will make you wise into salvation. And she begins to teach him how to serve the Lord and how to do all these things. And Paul says, man... That faith has been passed down. I can see it in you. And I know that there's somebody I can work with. And he begins to use him. And he's a big helper and a fellow laborer. And he helps uh, Paul tremendously. And so <clears throat> here is the conclusion I want to just point out. It's Mother's Day. And we all have mothers uh, or have had mothers at some point. But many of us had godly mothers. I'm not going to get a show of hands here, but many of us had godly mothers. Uh, To some degree, they were faithful, and they taught us good things. They pointed us to the Bible. Even if they didn't know all the answers, they did that. And I'm often mindful of, and of course we want to continue that on, and maybe have even a more spiritual generation that comes up after after our generation. But I'm often, often mindful of this idea that every time you see somebody out there, there's always an exception to this, but typically you see somebody out there who's a successful person, right? Even if it's a businessman, probably he had a good mother behind him, raising him, teaching him. Not always. I understand there are some exceptions where a man had to learn, you know, on his own to do certain things, but probably has some kind of good godly influence or at least godly type morals and and ethics, okay, that were taught to them. How many successful businessmen even probably had a faithful, loving, godly mother to thank? How many pastors, missionaries? I mean, I guarantee a lot of them. I hear a lot of preachers talk about, 
You know, where would I be if my mom didn't keep praying for me and keep, you know, pouring into me the God's word and dragging me to Sunday school and dragging me to a church? And, and I hear preachers talking about that all the time. And I think, man, we have a lot to be thankful for, you know, of, of mothers that were there for us and raised us and, and took care of us and passed on godly things to us. How many soul winners, you know? Various preachers, evangelists, whatever, they've, they've got faithful, loving mothers. And, uh, and we have somebody to, something to be thankful for, for sure. So some people think Christian women are so mistreated. I don't know. I've gotten that so many times. I remember having, having teens whose lives were falling apart, whose moms were like, uh, you know, women's lib, you know, and, they're, and their lives are falling apart. There's no man in their, there's no dad in their life. And, you know, they're in and out of drugs and they're on all kinds of stuff and they're getting in trouble all the time, you know, uh, calling me up with all kind of weird stuff, calling me up from the mental hospital. Hey, can you come visit me? All this kind of stuff. And then I would preach one message, you know, about the husband's role and the woman's role and whatever. And these guys would say just, man, I can't believe you tell your wife what to do, which I didn't actually say that, say it that way, but that's the way he, he interpreted it. I can't believe you tell your wife what to do. I just think women should be equal with men and they should have the right to do this and that. And I'm like, man, you are missing it. You're missing it all. You're trying to read into this, this worldview that's been fed to you through the public school about how all these fundamentalists just hate women and they're trying to keep the woman down and they're mistreating them and all that stuff. You're missing what womanhood is all about because you've been fed a lie about that. People think Christian women, fundamentalists especially, are mistreated. They're like second-class citizens, you know, stay-at-home servants or maids, and they just stay barefoot and pregnant all the time. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what we get taught. Uh, that's what we hear. They think that the woman has to be in su subjection, and she's not allowed to teach and preach in the church. And, man, these guys are so radical trying to keep the women down and all that. And maybe some of that is true. Maybe there are some limitations Maybe some things that might be, it just doesn't seem fair. It seems like a woman should be able to do this and that. But here's the thing that they're missing is that the woman has the responsibility, the potential, the, the, the built-in tools, and she's equipped to, to do this to raise a future generation. A mother has that power. Now, when we take away that power and we say, no, 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 I'll raise your kids for you. You go out into the workforce. They mess it all up. Yeah. All right. You need to go out there. You just pursue your own dreams. You go get your career. You go get whatever. We'll take care of your kids for you. The next generation is just totally messed up at that point. All right. But the woman has the opportunity if she follows the Bible and follows uh, what God has put in place here and what he's naturally given us you know, that works every time is that the woman has that ability to be godly, share that example with the kids, raise those kids, train them right so that they might live godly and they might go on to the next generation and actually do something. Guess what? She's got more power than the man. <laughs> I can go out. I mean, I can be an influence to my kids and I can go out and I can do all this stuff. But man, the future generation in many ways being shaped by the woman at home and you take that out of the out of the f equation and we are not saved through childbearing like God designed it to be that's what I think it means and that's a, I, something I definitely think is consistent throughout the Bible so let's pray and thank God for our mothers father thank you for the mother I had in my life and and that my wife had uh, in her life to raise her and and uh, and I pray, Lord, that you would just help us to show enough concern for future generations that we would seek your word and seek your face and say, what is my responsibility in raising the next generation? And Lord, I know your way works. It always works. And so I pray you help us to submit ourselves to it and uh, do the best of our ability what you have told us to do. We pray you be glorified. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, uh, just bless in a mighty way as uh, we seek to do your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.